We are ready to flag off for today. And hello, everybody, and welcome in joining us for the webinar on Mandai Core Innovation Program 2023 Reverse Peach. Now, I'm sure as a Singaporean or as someone in Singapore, you will not have missed the attractions of Mandai Wildlife Group, uh, naming from the bird paradise. Some of you might have gone to the soft launch, which was amazing. Yeah, my family went and it would be dazzled. And there's Night Safari, River Wonders, Singapore Zoo, and so much more. So they are dedicated to caring um, our, for our animals and nature. And of course, conservation, education, is something that do, they do very well. And at the present moment, they're actually driving an exciting rejuvenation plan, integrating all these wildlife parks with distinctive experiences as well. So today's webinar will actually enable you to go into a special access to gain exclusive insights into Mandai Wildlife Group's challenge statements and learn about their ongoing conservation efforts and the different challenges that you can help to solve and win up to $50,000 worth in prize monies per challenge. Now, I am Ching Hong and I'll be the MC and facilitator for today. Once again, just like to remind everybody that the webinar will be recorded and our microphones will automatically be set on mute throughout the entire session. And for you to raise any possible questions through the Q&A function where we will collate and answer via the speakers later on. Now, should you encounter any technical issues, once again, the Zoom chat is the place to go to reach out to our technical team. Now, in this webinar, we will learn more about animal care horticulture and guest experience and also get the opportunity to hear the challenges from the problem owner themselves. Now, before we start the reverse speech session by Mandai Wildlife Group, it is my pleasure to invite Mr. Ong Jingxuan from Mandai Wildlife Group to do a quick introduction of Mandai's innovation initiative. Jingxuan, please. Hello, a very good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Jingxuan from Transformation Office under Mal uh, Mandai Wildlife Group. So um, we are very excited to be part of the Open Innovation Program once again. And we've been actually working with IMDA since 2021, launching uh, our fifth call and 11 problem statements in total. So as you might know, Mandai is a very um, unique organization as uh, we have very uh, distinct problems that we and challenges that we face here. Um, our parks uh, present uh, Challenges such as like animal uh, that revolves around animal care, um, guest experience, and also sustainability of park operations. So um, that's why we would like to leverage on IMDA's uh, open innovation platform to uh, reach out to tech solvers like you to help us solve the problems that we face. Yep. Thank you very much, Xingxuan. Thank you. And thanks for bringing all these wonderful experiences to our tourists as well as the people of Singapore as well. Now, it says that it takes a village to raise a child, right? To, but to maintain a zoo as well as many, many wildlife parks, it truly takes the nation's effort as well as your digital initiatives to help uh, Mandai overcome some of the challenges that they might be facing. And being from outside the industry, I'm sure you are able to offer something even more innovative and possibly something out of the designated field, which might be very, very helpful and of value to Mandai Wildlife Group as well. Now, without further ado, we thank Jingxuan for sharing Mandai's initiative and would like to welcome up our first presenter. Once again, just invite everyone to ask questions, you know, with a lot of gusto, with enthusiasm in the Q&A tool that you will see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Now, today for our first presenter, we are going to welcome Mr. Chao Po Han. He is a nutrition manager in the Wildlife Nutrition Center at Mandai Wildlife Group, and he oversees the diets of animals and provides nutritional advice. He holds a master's degree in foraging ecology and is the appointed chair of the Caesar Nutrition Network, coordinating zoo nutrition projects in Asia. Sharing with us, he'll be presenting on the topic of smart animal body condition monitoring. With that, let's welcome Mr. Chow. Mr. Chow, please. Thank you very much for your kind introductions. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bohan. Um, it's my pleasure to have a chance to share with you guys regarding to um, the first challenges we are going to bring up. So before I actually um, starting my presentations, of course, I would like to share about that, why you guys are here, because uh, positive animal welfare is very important to Mandai Wildlife Groups. And why animal welfare is very important, because uh, we are always pay attention, animal is always our priorities, and animal, com animal welfare comes first before anything, right? So we are actually always trying to enhance the animal welfare and also optimize the staff productivity to be able to achieve uh, all the values and goals we have. And you are guys, you guys are here to actually help us achieve this. 
So before we actually move into the um the challenge today, I would like to share with you guys that why the welfare is very important. And there are five domains of uh, composed with um, animal welfare, and nutrition is one of them, and together with environment, health, behavior, and mental states. And today, the main topic I'm going to talk about would be nutrition. So to, in order to understand the nutrition status of the animals, actually body condition scoring, we call BCS, is one of very important tools for us to understand the nutritional status of the animals and how we're actually using the body condition scoring. So basically, body condition scoring is to use the visual assessments to understand that the current um, um, energy and also uh, nutritional status of the animals by um, understand the muscles and the fats conserved in animals. But probably some of you might um, question and uh, ask, asking about that, why we need to use body condition, condition scoring? Because first of all, that not all animals can be weighed, especially under the wildlife and exotic animals settings. It's not everyone, um, not all animals will be able to stay on the weighing, weighing scales and be able to be weighed. And the second reason why is because some of the animals, they have some assess issues. Either they are quite sensitive or we have not yet trained them to actually step onto the weighing scales. And we also know that different animals that have different bone structures. For example, that some of, some of the people actually tend to be taller, some of the people tend to be shorter. So using a body weight as one golden standard will not be able to apply to every single different structures of the animals as well. And the last thing is that because of uh, using body weight scoring by using the visual assessments, we will not to be able, we don't we do not have to you buy any expensive equipment or tools to be able to understand the nutritional status of the animal. So technically they are actually free. And I'm not so sure if you guys have any pets in your home. And if you do, I hope you also seen these kind of tables and guidelines uh, before. For example, like if you want to understand how is your dog and cats are doing well or not, um, there are some of the uh, commercial uh, body condition story guide out there for you guys to understand what would be the ideal body condition of the animals. But how we generally actually evaluate the body condition of the animals is based on uh, categorized animal body condition to different sports. The central, the more central, of the score, the more ideal the body condition is. The higher of the score indicate animals are either obese or overweight. The low of the score indicating the animals are either lean or emaciated. So these are very quick understanding uh, of the guideline. Usually you can find um, online or anywhere else, else uh, to evaluating the health of your animals. But what I shared earlier is actually more towards to the pets industry. But for the exotic and wildlife animal industry, actually there are still some of the appropriate guidelines for everyone to refer to. For example, these are some of the different exotic animal body condition scoring guidelines to be able to can be used online as a resources. But why online is so important? Because if you don't have any peer review and also um, uh, objective guidelines, actually you will actually somehow have a biased result because we why we want to use guidelines to try to avoid any humans and personal preference, any, any bias toward to when we, when we are scoring the animals. So having a guideline is super important when we're doing a body condition scoring of the animals. And why, why understanding the nutritional status of the animals is super important in terms of uh, making sure animals' welfare is not being compromised is because we have found that the body condition scoring are very highly related to some of the health issues of the animals under our care. And in the modern zoos and also pet industry, actually we are seeing much more obesity issues over those like emaciated or lean animals. And obesity has been found with whole highly correlated with many different kinds of health issues, for example, diarrhea, skin condition, diabetes, or lameness. So they are, these are all the problems where if we will be able to understand the current nutritional status of the animals by using BCS, we will be able to potentially prevent any health issues or the animals will potentially get in the future. And these are the general procedures uh, Mandawa wildlife groups are performing the regular body condition scoring of the animals. So basically we will form uh, evaluating, evaluating uh, committees, mostly composed by the keepers and nutrition staff. And then while we are having a, a breathing session, we will try to coach everyone how to actually evaluating the today's animal and what kind of species and guidelines we're going to use today. And why we are having so many evaluators because we want to have a uh, more sample size to be able to uh, prevent any specific bias by only scoring by one or two staff. So that's the first problem we come up with that, that we encounter with is by 
having different person, we still have a different opinions towards to how to score the animals and then what is the ideal score for these individuals. And the second thing is that, as you can understand that Mandawala groups, we have so many different species across the different individuals. So scoring every single individual can be very time consuming. So that's the second issues that we encounter. And the third one will be when we try to score the animals, we will have to compile all the data manually keying into Excel or Zeus, uh, international uh, um, data reporting for the zoos. And it also could be kind of very time consuming to actually compile all the scoring of a different evaluator and to put into a, a spreadsheet. And the last thing is that when we found that some of the animals are not under good conditions, we will have to take action. So most of the time, the action we took would be to change the diets of the animals. However, by taking so much time in evaluating the animals and also um, compiling the data, we won't be able to take very quick actions if we happen to find any of the animals are not under their good condition. So this is not a real time alert, also a system where we can use every life on. Therefore, some of the key challenges um, I would like to bring up so far will be the first one, a lot of wild resource could be potentially caused by different opinions or evaluators. It will depend on their capacity and ability towards to understanding the body condition of the animals. Secondly, is that we actually require all the evaluators to be on site together to actually perform such a body condition scoring sections. So it actually could be quite, um, quite time consuming. Together with so many different individuals and different species we have, under our care. And the, the fourth would be the tedious data recording and also compilations, where a lot of data require um, um, manually keying and it takes a lot of time. And lastly, as I shared earlier, that it will take a longer time as well in taking actions towards to the undesired body condition of the animals. So the challenge of today would be a smarter body condition score, scoring system where we appreciate everyone to give us some of the ideas where you can help us to resolve the problems. The first one we would like to suggest that the new system should be having a automatic and also precise monitoring of the body condition of the animals by effectively and efficiently assess the body condition scoring of the animals. And also minimize the human bias where we can react on some of the innovative programs to be able to close following up with the guidelines. Like I said earlier that Having a proper guideline is super important because we don't want it to be react on specific person preferences. And secondly, we want the system to be integrative and user-friendly because when we have in this kind of system and platform to be scoring animals, which should be, could be uh, easily incorporated into our IT infrastructure, infrastructure and applications, and the permits and submission of the pictures and videos of in intended animals can be easy to be done to upload, upload it to the platform. And the upload media could be labeled and documented for the future preferences. Because the more database we have in the future, we can actually somehow improve the precision and also uh, accuracy of the, the data we can uh, evaluate for future usage. And the features we like to um, have will be have a continuous and unsupervised learning and data recording. This is similar to what I said earlier that um, overall accuracy could be improved by, we, by when we submitting more and uploading more pictures and videos uh, for the system and also the, the, the program to be learned by itself. And then real-time alerts is also very important when any undesired body condition, which is not within the ideal range, you should be, um, those key holders should be able to uh, alert immediately to be able to take any actions and follow up as soon as possible. And lastly would be the, any proposed uh, solutions have to be non-invasive Meaning that because, like I said earlier, that the body control story is by using a visual assessment without intervening or interrupt any interactions of the animals. Therefore, the new proposed system should not also have that kind of, uh, should not have any invasive where adding any additional stress to the animals will not be preferred. This is uh, the species of the interest. Um, this is based on all the animals where we could potentially find a, a peer review guidelines out there from the hoof stocks and felines, canines, and some of the otters and the primates. But we know that there are some kind of like different level of difficulties depends on different species and taxons. So we will advise um, any solutions um, holders to be able to help us to pick up at least one species from each of the taxa to be able to try and test out um, if the system to be able to work uh, for all animals. So from low to high difficulties, uh, please choose one of each um, 
from five to eight species um, to be a test um, uh, species. And um, of course, the system, we also want to be ensuring that the body and scoring guideline will have to be always based on the guideline. So the data establishment will have to identify the key body parts of the animals for the bullet assessment. And the body condition definition of the score will be, have to be clear indicated and parameters should be strictly follow the guidelines. And the last thing is that <clears throat> the system validations will have to be performed with a trial to make sure that the minimal errors of the assessment to make sure that the outcome of the system to be able to um, in align with the actual assessment of how uh, we actually see of the animals. And of course, we also want to make sure that um, there will be a continuous at least uh, six months of the um, uh, maintenance to make sure that the system can be uh, running throughout. And the network will have to be complied with uh, our Mandawa IT security measurements. So that is pretty much the, the, um, the challenge briefing of my first part. I would like to see if anyone has any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pohan. I think that was quite an insightful presentation on the different challenges that we face. And across the entire Mandai Wildlife Group, we are sure that, um, as, as you have presented, there are many different animals that comes in all different shapes and sizes and needs as well. So I'm sure it's quite an uphill task and quite a challenge to undertake. But of course, um, for those of you who already have worked with similar projects in another setting, um, we, we, with animals or otherwise, feel free to take a shot at this as well. So this is the first challenge over here. First challenge statement on smart animal body conditioning, uh, condition monitoring as well. So just wanted to ask Pohan once more. I believe you raised up some um, stats along the way as well as some species of interest. So um, could you just recap for us what are some of the key stats that we are looking at again or is it different for every animal? So so <clears throat> yeah, so basically um, we are seeing right now is that we want to um, <clears throat> Each of the species, they are, their steps in general is very similar. By having a system to be able to, for us to upload those pictures of the animals and or even the videos, uh, when we submit the, the pictures of the animals, we will be able to directly see the evaluation of the body sensory of the animals as an outcome. And so therefore the species of each of the animals, I, I listing out just earlier right now with the low difficulties to high difficulties, yep. actually yes. depend, depends on our personal experiences, like for example, the primates, um, they could be quite challenging in terms of like uh, because they have a fur, they have a hair, so yeah. <laughs> they could be much more difficult in terms of for the system to actually to learn how to um identify the body conscious scoring of the of that species. But for the hoof dogs, like like the deers and also giraffe, um, they they are actually much more easier as long as you have a proper angle of the pictures. The system should be able to actually easier for for them to actually generate. A score. So basically, the steps is very similar. By establish a proper parameter of different body conditions of the animals, and then to allow the system to be able to give the scores for us, and for us to actually upload the pictures and automatically learning and unsupervised to improve the pre uh, precision accuracy with the time. So different species, different difficulty, but the steps are the same. Right. Thank you very much, Pohan. I think that's very enlightening. And of course, um, I'm sure there's quite a bit of information, especially on the different species that Pohan has mentioned. So please be assured that these slides will actually be uploaded on the Open Innovation Platform, where you can view the slides again for your perusal and for your um, discretion on which of the species you would like to work on first. And there's actually another great question by Ram Raju. I think tapping on the existing resources that you know, Mandai Wildlife Group might have already have in place. His question is actually on how do we identify which animal we are looking at within an animal group, such as a herd of elephants. How do we know that this is elephant number, uh, elephant A, elephant B, etc.? Is that already some tagging in place? Um, you know, even though like vision system can identify an elephant, but they might not know it's elephant A. So anything that's already in place for identification of a particular animal? Yeah, mm, thanks a lot. This is a <clears throat> very good question. So. So basically what we have right now is that um, we have a group of the animals where we can individually identify them. So when we perform a body and scoring of the animals, we actually will write them down um, who are we uh, scoring to right now in the moment. So while we actually scoring the animals, um, identify what the species and individual they are, we will be able to track in how the body and scoring evolved with the time. So ideally, we actually always prefer to actually identify every single individuals. But we do also have the groups of the animals. For example, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of individuals of the deers and night safari. And I mean, to be honest, like, none of us need to be able to really 
100% this individual is who. So what we actually trying to do is that for the herds, um, a group of the animals, we were just trying to scoring them one by one, but without identifying them. So the only, that is the so-called, the, the issues we have where for those animals, we can actually identify them. We will try our best to identify them. We will be able to see how the body can scoring score involved with the time. But the rest of the individual, like as a group, we can not never identify them. We were just scoring based on them and which we are comfortable with. As long as we still have the, they are also within the ideal body condition scoring range. And that would be fine. Right. I understand. So th there's not always a need to identify, oh, the elephant is Dolly, the other one is Jack and, and things like that. It might be okay yeah. if you just have a herd and you understand all the individual stats. And if there's any particular animal um, that seems out of sorts, and then we can send a real-time alert and that will then require human intervention. Is that right, Pohan? Yes, that's right. 100% right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pohan. Thank you so much for your presentation and um, we love to connect with you again. And for those of you who are interested in the challenge, once again, we'll upload the slides again. Thank you, Pohan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. And moving on to our next speaker, of course, um, we have the Vice President of Vet Veterinary Healthcare of Mandai Wildlife Group, Dr. Xie Shangzhe. And the department that Dr. Xie and Dr. Shangzhe actually leads is actually ensuring the health and welfare of the animals under the group's care is maintained through regular routine health checks, evidence-based diagnosis, treatment of diseases, as well as cutting-edge veterinary medicine. Now, prior to Mandai Wildlife Group, Dr. Shangzhe has actually worked in various veterinary practices all across the world. Now, sharing with us on the challenge of, of smart bird breeding monitor in nest boxes, let's welcome Dr. Shangzhe. Dr. Shangzhe, please. Hi, Dr. Shangzhe. Is it all good on your side? Yes. Uh, okay. Sorry. Trying to figure out how to Thank unmute you. Uh, have now. <laughs> Uh, you can see my screen, right? Yes, very clear. All right. So, yeah, this uh, our second challenge uh, is we're looking for a smarter way to monitor bird breeding in nest boxes. And uh, you might wonder what nest boxes are. Uh, so not all birds lay eggs and uh, have their chicks grow up in a nest. And some birds like to find tree hollows, that is uh, holes inside a tree. Uh, or some of them like holes uh, on a rock wall, for example. And for those types of birds, when we try to breed them in uh, bird paradise, we would need to use something that replicates that kind of environment for them. Uh, and the closest thing we can get to is a nest box. You see in the picture there, there's an example of a variety of nest box sizes. Uh, depending on the bird species, they need different size and shape holes for the adults and the chicks to enter and exit the nest box. They need different depths, different uh, heights. Uh, so we have quite a big variety of this. And uh, some of them are even made like very realistic. The one you see in this picture here uh, is meant to replicate a tree trunk. Uh, the problem with these nest boxes are that uh, once the female uh, usually goes in there, uh, the male, a lot of times, uh, will seal up the nest box, which means that uh, you cannot actually see the female, and subsequently the eggs, uh, they are hatched, and the chicks, uh, you cannot monitor them at all, because the male just puts the food in the female's mouth, uh, and all you get to see from the outside is the female's beak coming out uh, to get the food. And uh, species such as hornbills do this, Parrots use, uh, some parrots use nest boxes as well. It's just that parrots, uh, they don't seal it up so they can come in and out a bit more frequently and it makes it easier for us to monitor it if it's a parrot. But for hollow bills right now, it's almost impossible for us to see anything once they're sealed up inside. The other problem is that when you do try to go in and have a look, say even if it's a parrot, uh, sometimes you try to take a peek inside and if it scares the female or even the male sometimes, then uh, they can abandon the nest box. The best case scenario is that they just don't come back to incubate the eggs anymore. Uh, it's not a big problem for us because then we can move it to an artificial incubator and still manage to hatch the eggs that way. But then some uh, other birds would throw the eggs on the floor uh, so that you know they're not usable anymore. So we don't want that to happen. 
uh, we actually have tried to make a uh, smarter nest boxes before. And the one in the picture you see is actually uh, one from a long time ago when we reintroduced the Oriental Python bill into the wild in Singapore. I don't know if you know the story, but they, that species used to be extinct in uh, the mainland of Singapore for a while. And then together with MPARCs, we embarked on a project to reintroduce them into the wild. And for part of the project, we use uh, the model that you see in the picture there to be able to monitor uh, how the birds are doing in the wild, especially uh, when it comes to breeding and having new chicks grow up and being able to survive in the wild. So this nest box had a camera inside uh, with the infrared function because it's very dark in there. We need to be able to see uh, using infrared uh, functions. And then there's a weighing scale that tells us roughly how the chick is growing and then their temperature and humidity sensors in there as well. Uh, separately, we have been exploring more advanced technologies recently. What you see in the picture there is not in the nest box, but it actually has all the components that we think might go into a nest box to make it smarter. So this uh, is a food uh, bowl with a stand in front of it uh, so that the bird stands on the perch and inside the perch it's built in a microchip scanner. Uh, some of our birds are tagged with a microchip to identify them. So once they stand there, it scans, they tell us which bird that is. There's a weighing scale on that white platform that everything sits on and it tells us its weight. And then there's a camera behind to tell us that it's actually putting its uh, head into the football and actually eating the food. Uh, so very similar technologies, I think, can probably be built into a smartness box. Uh, and ultimately, what we want to be able to answer is uh, how we can remotely monitor uh, and assess activities and conditions in and around the avian's nest box. Uh, and around is important as well because the male uh, doesn't always go into the nest box, so we want to know what the male is doing uh, outside, whether he's providing enough food to the female and the chick. And that picture there is a very cute uh, chick uh, of a great pie hornbill. And we don't get to see this inside the nest box. Uh, this one's hand raised, that's why we can take such a nice photo of it. But uh, with a smart nest box, we want to be able to see them grow up uh, according to what you see on the screen as well. Uh, some of the things we would want monitored is uh, frequency of visitation, meaning how many times the male comes and provides food to the female and chick. We want to know uh, whether eggs are laid, and if they are, how many are laid, so that we can expect, uh, we know how many chicks to expect to emerge from there. Uh, we want to know the environmental conditions, uh, it's specifically temperature and humidity, but uh, anything extra will help us make decisions. So for example, if it's starting to get too hot and too humid inside the nest box, then we might need to uh, intervene by lowering the temperature around the nest box so that hopefully in there it uh, decreases or becomes cooler as well. And uh, we also want to have a way of monitoring what happens to the chick and the female inside, whether it's growing as we expect, uh, whether it's uh, overheating, whether it's breathing too far, us, uh, therefore, as a sign of it being in trouble inside the nest box. Because sometimes when things go wrong in there, uh, we don't know until it's too late, and all we can do is go in and retrieve the body of a dead chick, which we don't want to do. Uh, other considerations we need for such a nest box is uh, we need to minimize the need for the humans to be near the nest boxes. So if we need to go in or around the nest box to be able to get the data. It's not as ideal as us being able to just uh, monitor all the parameters from a computer screen uh, so that we don't have to go disturb the birds if we don't have to. Uh, we also would like such a system to alert us of any abnormalities or any deviation from the usual. For example, if the weight starts to look like it's increased a lot and you shouldn't have, or it's decreased uh, compared to the previous two days, then we want to be alerted so that we can go and check it out and see whether it's a system fault or whether it's actually something with the birds that we need to take care of. And lastly, uh, uh, quite importantly, is that we need 
whatever fixtures in the nest box to be safe for birds. Uh, and it needs to be safe for a wide variety of species, such as songbirds, parrots, and hornbills. Uh, a lot of these species have very strong beaks and claws, and they are also very inquisitive. So whatever looks a bit weird to them, if there's a shining light, for example, they might uh, want to use their beaks to explore it. And their definition of explore a lot of times uh, includes breaking whatever is there. Uh, there are more detailed uh, requirements in a challenge statement. So have a look at the document online. I guess the idea and the theories are very simple here. It's uh, We look forward to what you have to offer. Yeah, Thank you, you very much, questions? Dr. Shangzhe. Thank you very much. So and for any questions, please raise through the Q&A once more. And of course, um, I believe once again, there are a lot of details in the presentation slides that you might want to review and feel free to do so on the open innovation platform where slides will be uploaded as well. So um, just uh, out of curiosity, Dr. Shangzhe, I think this might be one of the questions that the participants might want to know is that roughly how many species, um, different species are we looking at? Because I, I do see that they have different breeding boxes. And what's, what's the quantity of deployment? Because I do believe that certain sensors might be a little bit more expensive to deploy. So depending on the quantity and the type that is required to build, um, the cost might might be or might not be within range of the budget that's, that's allocated. Yeah. Mm. I think we would expect uh, at the very least a big one. So let's say a hornbill size nest box. And then a smaller one, uh, maybe a small parrot, like a lorikeet type size nest box. Uh, so that we know how scalable these things are. Like if you can make the smallest and the biggest, then the intermediates shouldn't be too hard to adjust for. Right, true. So the uh, minimum viable product, I, I would assume here, will be a small box for the smaller breed of birds and a bigger one for the hornbill size of birds. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shangzhe. I'm sure many of you might have more questions after you review the presentation and gather more thoughts as well. So we'd like to thank Dr. Shangzhe for your time over here for the Q&A as well. And of course, um, for anybody to continue to con um, connect with the Mandai Wildlife Group to understand more about the challenge in detail to craft a suitable solution. Thank you, Dr. Shangzhe. Thank you. And of course, up next... Um, over here, we are moving on to our third speaker of today. And today we have Mr. Eric Leong. He's a certified arborist from the horticulture department. So other than the wonderful animals and, you know, that we love to take pictures of, the environment is also of utmost importance. And of course, if you have been to any of the wildlife parks, you know they are really, really beautiful in terms of the landscape as well. So today we have Mr. Eric Leong and he's a digital native and having a passion for technology in this interest. He is driven to champion innovation by harnessing technology to boost the capabilities of our digital transformation for arboriculture. So sharing on the challenges of smart detection alerts in horticulture maintenance, let's welcome Eric Leong. Eric, please. Hi everybody, uh, Eric once again. I'll be sharing with you about the horticulture uh, tree inspections. Uh, challenge that we want to that we are proposing. Right. So, first of all, our existing problems is that uh, our that sorry our existing process is labor intensive, time consuming, costly, and is very dependent on the visual accuracy of our human inspectors, and this could also and the site conditions. So, Madara Group wants to. Uh, leverage on all these new di di digital technologies to enhance our productivity and optimize for our staff efficiency. And we are oh, having this uh, innovation, we are participating in this innovation program to get uh, innovation from another perspective. Right, so what we expect from this system is a system for inspection, detection, and execution. Uh, to reduce the dependency on uh, labor and time taken for tree inspections. Uh, so for me to further elaborate, I'm, I'm going to go through some possible use cases. Um, currently, we are inspecting trees physically on site. We have to go down to a tree and measure their curves, uh, look at their conditions, so and so forth, which consume time, resources, and sometimes they are restricted. We are restricted from entering because we not only work around the plants, we have to work around animals as well. 
this could um accumulate a lot of human fatigue, uh, which leads to a lot of errors on on the ground. So we want to be able to have these inspections remotely and be able to take virtual measurements. So for example, um this tree that you can see, this image you can see on the left is a tree that is leaning on another tree in an exhibit. We are not allowed to enter these exhibits uh, during operating hours. However, if say uh, someone notifies us of any issues of the tree, we, are, we have to go in and take a look at the tree. Uh, which leads us to all these time restrictions and us being physically restricted from entering the site. However, these are all concerns that we have and uh, it's very time uh, sensitive. Right. This is a clearer image of the tree. And for this case, I would say that it would be an ad hoc case of uh, inspection. Uh, so we would need to go to conduct our inspections on these trees which we might not have access to uh, which is why we will need all of these uh, virtual tools uh, that we that we will be able to secure. Uh, additionally, you will have to be concerned about the animals which are within the exhibit. Uh, so that might include loud noises and having even drones might not be allowed into this space physically, which would cause us issues. Right. Secondly, our first other possible use cases is for early detection, a multi spectral tracking of tree growth and health to detect any issues that might come out from a tree or even for their growth patterns. Hopefully, this will come along with a machine learning analysis. Um, compared to what we have as our existing practice, we have to rely on the visual line of sight to pick up any defects and there's no smart system for early detections. For this, we can look at a tree plant growth as it crosses over a certain threshold. We have to prune back the trees in order to uh, maintain a clear line of sight for gas to look at the living collection. And also we want to be able to have a de detection which is not detectable by the human eye to see if a tree is leaning or it has any visual effects on it. I would say that this is more towards a routine check, which is different from our ad hoc check, uh, as this is for early detection once again. So once we hit uh, these criteria, we want to look at uh, structure and stability of our trees, and this is just some to a few. Uh, we want to have smart tracking and identification so we can track and analyze all of this data that we have. We want to identify and detect decay. We want to be able to manage all this information. We want to be able to label, classify all of this, hopefully with a smart uh, identification system. We need to have a bunch of this data so that we can refer back to all this old data easily. Uh, we need a situation analysis and pattern detection for these uh, plants and sites so that we understand uh, these patterns, any patterns that emerge from, from this growth. Say we, we have some pests and the group of trees are having an issue with them, we want to be able to identify notify and we'll be able to uh, come in and deal with the issues before it gets really bad. Of course, we want to see all this in on the dashboard, have real time alerts to all this. And once again, the learning algorithm, machine learning, help us identify all of these issues uh, early on. We want this to be user friendly and portable, durable, so we are able to bring it out on the site, have it weatherproof, uh, able to integrate with other systems, uh, assess on the go. And we hope that whoever provides us with these innovations and solutions will be able to support and do some maintenance of these continuous maintenance and support of these systems. If you want more specific uh, requirements, you can can be found in the channel's brief. If not, please reach out to us and we'll be able to explain 
more in detail about what we learned about it. Right, sorry. Do we have any questions? Thank you very much, Eric. I think that was pretty clear on the different um, types of like um, challenges that you, you guys might fi- face at the park as well. So just wondering, like um, I, I, I remember you mentioning about like, for example, the early prevention of diseases to the trees and plants and mm-hmm. things like that. I think those are uh, about the conditions of the plant itself. But um, can, can I understand from a maybe a data and sensor point of view, what are the mm-hmm. key indicators like the humidity or uh, talking about the temperature or how, what, what are the key things that we need to monitor to determine whether uh, the plant is growing in good condition? That is actually a very subjective thing to say, but uh, we could actually learn from, say, okay. it's not really clear-cut, so we actually have to, mm. uh, we have to look at many factors. Uh, visually, there could be dieback and there could be um, Dieback is when a tree is, uh, sorry, a bunch of area is built, built and tree starts to abandon that particular limb. However, that might actually occur for a whole tree or actually that might be just a tree shedding. So there might be very, a lot of different reasons why a tree could actually drop, or, drop its leaves. It could also be an indication of some sort of uh, pest. So we, that's why we need to have the human factor to come in, but we want a detection of this. Uh, a tree leaning, yes, and of course a tree doesn't actually use, uh, grow straight all the time. It actually could be affected by the, its environment, mm. which is why we would need to detect, uh, have a de- detection active and uh, routine to be able to tell the difference and be alerted on what is actually required at that point. I see. So it, it's pretty subjective and uh, customized to different trees lah, per se, the conditions. Yes, uh, Understood. Right. Thank you, thank you. And uh, there's another question coming from Flex. And Flex mm-hmm. is asking that um, question from Mr. Eric. What are the systems that you would like to be integrated and how many trees to be monitored? I think yeah. at least for the initial stage, like how many trees are we looking at and maybe what type of trees? Is there a priority? Because I, I, I'm given to understand that there should be quite a number of plants and trees in the wildlife parks itself. Yeah, uh, there is actually quite a lot of trees. Uh, yeah. we would, uh, once again, this area would be spread over like um, two types. One is the ad hoc and one is the routine. For the, the routine ones, we could maybe look at a small area first that we are uh, not to uh, be able to, we are flexible on the amount of trees that you is able to uh, inspect to, to maintain. Uh, so maybe a hundred or so, maybe. If, can always go for a smaller area if tired. For ad hoc area, we'd probably just be looking at very specific trees, so maybe one tree, or maybe some uh, areas that we require. So we yeah, are flexible right. on that portion. There is a whole range of different species of trees. I think a good start would be probably our 1,001 trees that we have in our works in the, what we are talking the, okay. the common species the common species yes right right so there's a routine area and there are some ad hoc areas that we, um, they could essentially try as a as, as a different project to see whether it's viable but yes, the routine the area will be ones. the focus yeah right yep. thank you and um, there, there was a question about what are the are there any systems uh, yes the systems yeah, yeah. yeah. so uh, we currently do not have any systems uh, in place right now however we are looking forward to having a lighting action system that will be having a smart alert if the system could into this system could integrate with other systems as well that would be great so probably some sort of uh, RPA or some sort of uh, just communication between the softwares would be great right so to provide some alerts in case a tree actually drops or yeah, you know right. some, some kind of safety concerns over there as well all yeah. right so um in short no systems to um the, the system has to be integrated uh with mm-hmm. the central uh I, I guess the infrastructure of what uh mwg oh, has, no. has at the moment or we it could be sent we no system do not have a system in place it's just a uh, other systems which like uh we are looking to procure a uh, like oh okay yeah, yeah. so 
Yeah, uh, so they, they are free to propose this as well. Lah, yes, right? correct. In relevance to the system. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so Sorry. much. Thank, thanks, Eric. And um, thank you so much for the questions as well. I'm sure there'll be more questions on the forum popping up later as well. And we do hope that um, our partners from Mandai Wildlife Group will be able to help to answer those questions on the forum later on. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And today we have come on to, we have had three presentations so far and we're down to our very, very last speaker today. And for our final speaker, we have Miss Karine Ng. Karine will actually be sharing with us on the challenges of acoustic localization. So on the topic of smart identification and localization of wildlife in the rainforest. So Karine is actually one of the pioneer team members involved in the conceptualization of the project, project's vision. She has contributed to the conceptualization as well as the curation of the visitor experiences for the bird paradise and the new rainforest park in various fields. So um, as an architect, she manages exhibition design, project coordination, architectural design, animal exhibit design, and has design and construction knowledge of the largest aviary system in the world, animal containment strategy, as well as pest control for animal enclosure. So with her experience, she manages to translate visitor journey and experiences into technical design with animal as well as operational requirements. So today we will be having Karine to present the final presentation and feel free once again to send any questions via the Q&A along the way of the presentation. So we're going to hand over the time to Karine. Hi Karine. Hi, thank you. Okay, so for today, uh, maybe we'll touch point a bit differently because we are, I'm not going to uh, focus on operation requirement. So I'm actually representing Mandai Global. We are actually, Mandai Global is actually a part of Mandai Wildlife Group but we are focusing on establishing uh, new operating lines of business. That's why we are focusing on ecotourism today. So there's this uh, ecotourism segment that we are actually going into this untouched virgin forest in Brunei. And because of, to create a visual experience in the national park, we actually needed a system or a solution to provide data about our adjacent forest and surrounding so that it will enhance the visual experience for whoever to come to visit the national park. Okay, so the idea is to learn more about the forest through the system or, or technology that we are creating here. Okay, some of the pain points about uh, knowing about the forest in the wild is actually because of its density of the forest, the weather condition, and also the field work required to co collect all this data. So the idea is to create a more comprehensive approach to have all this data collected uh, digitally through camera traps and even autonomous recording units, we call it camera recorders to actually actively candidate data such as pictures, uh, video, or even sound recording in the forest. So we're looking for some uh, a product or solution that we can actually uh, deploy this uh, camera trap and acoustic recorders in the uh, tropical rainforest about maybe like a five kilometer radius. So they will be able to do it in a, um, an integration where all this data will be collected through uh, this machine or this machine itself will be able to identify which species they are able to identify in the forest. For example, let's say this camera trap is uh, has taken a series of photos or identified a series of photos across a month or two months during this uh, period. But using that data, right, the data is actually further sorted out to know which species have been identified, what time have they been identified, and how frequently or even very specifically to identifying individuals in the future. Okay, so in as the environment for the machine is actually uh, not in the urban setting, it's in the rainforest. So we're looking for something that is more durable uh, in the uh, in the climate, like uh, terrestrial rain uh, that could be occasional uh, tree fall and things like that. So these are things that have to be mindful about. So, uh, but how can we conduct objective surveys to localize the animals in the Brunei rainforest, right? So as you know that Brunei, if everyone not very familiar with the site itself, it's actually over here. So in Brunei, actually it's in the two main portions. So we're focusing on the smaller portion here called Ulu Taburong. So even though it's one of the smallest country in Borneo, it's actually one of the most diversified in terms of density of uh, wildlife. So the idea was to have this smart monitoring system and also in, in the end, uh, contribute to intelligent nesting. So we actually have a wildlife mapping of the Taburong rainforest from our eco lodge here. So uh, over the years, our visitors, who, like the guests who come into the lodge will actually contribute to the improvement of the inventory. So for example, the guides will actually bring them 
to actually activate the camera traps or activate the sound recording devices and for them to start to inventorize or to help us inventorize all the findings that we can find in the rainforest. So the idea is to also create a live comprehensive digital map that over the years we will build up to have this uh, catalog of information that we so that we will be able to understand the forest better. Okay, so um, as you can see, there are some other references in the uh, US or in the Amazon rainforest that actually are open platform for new technology solution. So we want to create this data, right? Could be actually shared across board internationally for local, regional, or researchers to contribute to the conservation of the rainforest. And this open platform will be able to access for researchers or even public around the world. So maybe just a little bit of sharing of experience because uh, usually in the rainforest, um, if you were to go in as a guest, a guide will actually bring you around to show you the pinpoints where you are. This is actually uh, orangutan or rhino or something like this along the line. But these are actually done through very manual intensive sightings. For example, a guide will actually go very early in the morning. They will actually recce the site, find out what are the animals nearby, then come back and report so that they will be able to and, uh, bring the guests to where the animals are. But this is actually a very um, periodic kind of sighting and there's no data collection involved in this uh, field work. So it's very minimal technology and also very manual intensive as well. And then the data itself is actually, um, the experience itself is very depending on what the guide can deliver on a day. So it's a very uh, ad hoc basis. So what we want to do here is actually doing a very much more comprehensive study in terms of the smart monitoring. So we're able to get not just like a period of day, a time where, where the guide actually go out in the field work, but 24 seven monitoring and also data collection. And this data collected can be analyzed by AI or even machine learning over the years itself. Okay. At the end, the camera surveillance can actually uh, eventually enhance the system that what we have in the ecology and animal natural behavior. So it will help to identify the species or even individuals, calculate whether the, for example, this particular animal is coming in very frequently or they are not coming very frequently. Or for example, they only come in during this period of time during like the uh, correlated events, for example, there's a flowering event of this particular tree or footing event. That's where the animals are frequently uh, found at this area. So these are some of the target species that we are looking for. The species of hornbills in Tabron, seven species here, and also two main primates such as the Northern Grey Gibbon and the Hosea Gibbon. So for the Gibbon, they are actually very vocal species and also the hornbills. So the idea is to use uh, not just camera traps, but also use acoustic recorders to be able to record the proximity of their location as well. So at the end of the day, the idea is to create a map where every guest will start to come in to build a catalog or help to build this uh, catalog of resources. So the integration of the unit itself is to tell, for example, this guest, uh, maybe let's say, um, Erika has come in on this date and she has her camera trap or her acoustic recorder has that was being deployed by her has identified a langur, a civet, or a northern grey uh, gibbon over the period of her stay. And for a researcher, it will be for our ecologists, it will be very useful to know a specific time that we identified, whether they are in a group or whether they are in a, a solo activity. So I think over uh, this slide here is to really break down what is the requirement for the components that is required for this uh, surveillance. So this surveillance, uh, we actually have shared more details in the report itself. So you can refer to the challenge brief and take a look into any uh, queries that you might have and post it to us. Okay, so maybe I run through the future plan. So uh, as you know, the eco lodge itself is just uh, a small building actually over here. The idea is to map out a radius behind a hill behind the, the forest itself. At the very initial stage, we will actually deploy a non-permanent camera trap and a post-it recorder to do a preliminary assessment about where the animals are. So from this assessment, it could take about four months, uh, two weeks at each one to actually cover the area. And eventually from the survey, we will identify the first eco-sentinel. When from the first eco-sentinel, we have more like a permanent lock-in location. So the camera trap or acoustic recorder could be at this permanent location would be self-sufficient. For example, if there's any, they will have memory storage, uh, energy in terms of uh, energy usage from the solar or some sort of performance for a battery. Okay. 
Then from this eco, uh, permanent eco sentinel, we'll move on to other areas to continue mapping the area temporarily and set up permanent eco sentinels. So over the years, eventually the idea is to do a triangulation of the devices to find out what are the, what are the activities around the forest over uh, a one year time frame or even longer to a five year time frame. Okay. So this is an, that's a general idea of what is the area that we're focusing on. So if any questions, feel free to post it over here. Thank you very much, Karine. Very, very exciting plan on the Mandai Global. I think none of us would have known about it if not for you. Thank you so much for sharing. Okay. And I think it's very, very cool to have something that is crowdsourced. So you have like visitors and guests, you know, going out to mm. really become the people who capture these activities of animals and be able to feed back to a system um, where others can actually leverage. And with more outposts, I believe they are able to triangulate um, where the, you know, the herd of animals or, you know, the group of animals is moving, moving as well. I think it's quite exciting. Um, but it does sound like a very, very big scale project that requires quite a lot of expertise and solutions as well. So feel free to ask any questions via the Q&A right now. But at the moment, I just wanted to check in with Karine as well. So um, you mentioned about like, um, I think two things, if I mentioned, if I remember correctly, one is on the sound part of things. The other one is more on the visuals. Is, is that right? So there's a part about like taking photos yeah. of the animals and the other one was more, more mm. on the sound. So um, do they, are you looking at like two separate devices because of the positions that they might be located? Yes. Yes, okay. it's two separate devices. So I in mm. I think in the earlier slide here, so camera a camera trap, a yeah. camera trap will be able to record uh, photos and videos. So nowadays technology is quite advanced. Mm. So the camera trap will only be activated when they detect movement. Right, and right. they also have a night sense, a motion, uh, night camera mode. Yeah. So even during at night, you will be able to detect and do recording as well. So right. we actually have tested out a few camera traps in the forest before. And it works uh, quite well. I see, I see. So may I ask, like, um, on the basis of this uh, Open Innovation Challenge, what are the current constraints for, from this current uh, recorders and traps that we have? Or are you looking at developing a platform that can can integrate this, these recordings? Yeah, mm. so the, the challenge right now is, for example, this camera trap has batteries inside, okay? Mm. This battery can only last a limited number of hours uh, during the course of the day. Okay, uh, maybe about two to three days or even if longer a week because there's a lot of data, uh, energy usage through camera detection, taking photos and videos as well. And also the limited storage capacity of, a, let's say, a 32, the, uh, 32 gig memory card, for example. Okay, so the idea is to create a more self-sufficient system where we can permanent uh, install it on site. So this camera track could be uh, installed there for the entire year, no problem, self-sustaining, uh, able to send the data that they have collected to a machine to able to identify and sort and filter the data. Right. So for example, they have captured five photos or ten photos at uh, one day for that particular day, and that data can be sent to the uh the main computer to sort and filter out. So they have identified uh longer or uh, maybe some hour on the ground or maybe a deer that has just passed through or a pig, for example. Yeah. Right, so to have a data feed, not just to record, but also a data feed in that sense. Correct. Yeah. Right, and right. And that data, if ideally, could be like real time. So, mm. for example, our main ground is the, the lodge itself. Okay, the data can be sent back to the lodge. And then from there, we can tell the guest, oh, you know, at this hour, this particular animal has been spotted. Then there's at least, in, in terms of experience for guests, it build up their excitement. And they, because some, for example, most of the animals are nocturnal, so they don't really come up during the day. So right. at least they are, uh, the, the idea is to actually bring out this uh, uh, information sharing and also telling them about what are the natural habitats of animals and behavior in the, in the national park. Right. Thank you so much. I, I noticed that uh, real time is pretty important as it was mentioned across all the <laughs> presenters as well. <laughs> right, right, right. But of course, um, I think the most important thing is to come up with something that's more viable. Um, like Karim mentioned earlier, something that's more durable and lasting um, mm. and also at the same time be able to capture the movements of the animals, the sights and sounds primarily and to be able to be, um, uh, you know, uh, 
outbest these current solutions that have very, very big limitations, which require a lot of um, human interference, maybe in changing batteries or re replacing yeah. memory cards and this. I, th I think that's the primary portion. And the added value will then be that ability to send data in real time. Yes. Ah, right. I'm, I'm not sure whether they're able to get 5G in that Brunei forest, but maybe we can. Yes. <laughs> I mean, yes. So the, the thing is the infrastructure is still building up. So the yeah. tech building and this will do in Singapore. Yeah. Okay. So of course, that's why we want to build a system that is robust enough. If that is the uh, location constraint, let's say this, this location is constrained because there's no data, then maybe we need to do a a, a wire mesh kind of system mm. where you send, mm. yeah, instead of right. a 4G sending out to a satellite and coming back. Yourself. Right. So 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 possible um deployment of interim solutions for yes. a stopgap measure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Karine. Uh, we really appreciate your time and thanks for sharing this. We would have never known what Mandai Global was doing and this amazing initiative. Thank you, Karine. Thank you. No yeah. And I'm sure once again there are a lot of information that you will have gleaned from all these presenters and their presentations. So once again, we want to um, give a big thank you to Jing Xuan for sharing on the Mandai Reverse Peach. Um, we also have uh, you know Po Han earlier sharing on smart animal body conditioning monitoring, as well as the smart bird breeding monitor in nest boxes by Dr. Sang Tzu. I believe you would remember that as well. And also um, by Eric, there was a little bit more information on the horticulture and the smart detection alerts, as well by Karine, it'll be a little bit more on the global side of things on the smart identification and localization of wildlife in the rainforest. So we thank all our presenters for spending your valuable time and we thank all our audiences as well, you know, for asking great questions and at the same time, um, you know, thinking about the possible solutions that we have for these challenge statements. So I do understand it is a lot to digest. Right, So please feel free to head over to openinnovation.sg. There is a forum's component and that is where you can actually further post your questions and the team will answer them as soon as possible and for any unanswered questions during the stream the answers will also be provided at the forum on openinnovation.sg as well so we thank you for your time and of course um, we would love to hear the feedback from you so if you don't mind just giving us just a bit of like one to two minutes of your time um, please do help us to feel free to scan this QR code to go to a GovSG link where we can collect more feedback about how we can do this better so at the same time we're scanning and doing this feedback as well um, I would love to invite you for all these innovation programs that IMDA has in store for you so there's one coming out on circular design there's one more coming out on AR VR and they are all in the pipeline to provide greater information as well as greater resources and support for you on your digital innovation journey. There are grants, there are programs, there are coaching, there are very, very um, interesting equipment and very useful areas for you to tap on on IMDA Pixel. So feel free to contact us over there. We'll be really, really happy to support you on your innovation journey once more. Once again, thank you so much for coming to our webinar today. And of course, this is the Mandai Co-Innovation Program 2023 Reverse Peach. We hope you have gleaned some really great insights over there and we'll see you on the OIP Open Innovation Forum. Thank you so much. My name is Ting Hong. Pleasure to be hosting for this today. Thank you. And of course, have a great day. Thank you.